Tonight we're going to be studying faith is a life of action. And as we get into this, I'm going to come at it at a little bit different uh, perspective tonight. You know, as believers, we should always be reading the Word of God. But there's something unique when the Holy Spirit begins to lead you to a portion of the Word of God. Uh, he has been doing that the last a couple of weeks with the books, uh, book of Isaiah with me. And uh, it's amazing what you see when, you, what you, when the Holy Spirit's leading you compared to just reading through something. Uh, the other day, I, I, I spent an entire day, it was, it was just like, I was like a kid in a candy store that I uh, had my, my computer going and I had three different computer programs going doing research. And between the three programs, I've got about 10,000 volumes that I could research and I had an entire table uh, covered with a lot of the books that I have at home, researching, digging into the, the book of Isaiah, and uh, really seeing some things that kind of correlate with where America is today, where we are in a lot of things today that we may end up being uh, touching on in, in future sessions. But I also ran into something very interesting in Isaiah chapter 7, and I, I want to preface this with some things because we're actually going to need to get in, into temporal mechanics to really understand uh, some of these things in the Word of God. Now, we always wrestle, and I, I just finished watching a video where a lot of the New Agers are talking about uh, how that they are, are they're becoming gods. And, uh, of course, that's the whole root of being Buddha and all these different things. And it's the lie of Lucifer that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 that you'll be as a god. And so you have all these uh, crazy people running around saying, I am. I am the great I am. And they don't even have uh, a minuscule concept of what it means to be God. And I want to give you an example because th this is going to kind of illustrate how God deals with things. God does not move through linear time. He fills all time. He fills all space. We, we call that uh, his, his omnipresence. And it's not that he, he just fills the universe. He is cognizant of everything that goes on in the universe. But it, at, with the same way he can do that, all of time, past, present, and future for him is now. That's why he is the I am. If you could imagine for a moment that you could become acutely aware of just your breathing and your heartbeat, that you could feel the air going into your lungs, exiting your lungs, you could feel the blood going through all the veins uh, in your body, and just for that one second be conscious of that. And then take it down another level that you're aware of the oxygen molecules that go into your bloodstream from your lungs and that you're aware of just that one second of every red blood cell, uh, blood, vessel, or blood cell, every white blood cell, all the plasma and in the, in the exchange, the dance they do with exchanging carbon uh, dioxide with, uh, with oxygen and going back and forth. And you're aware of all of that in your entire bloodstream for that one second. Now let's take it a step further that you're aware of what is going on in every single cell of your entire body. That you're aware of its function, how it's functioning, which ones are abnormal, which ones are functioning properly, which ones are dying, which ones are being created. And you're aware of, of the millions upon millions of, of cells that make up your entire body and you can see them and understand what's going on with all of them all at, in that one second. Then you take it down to the submolecular level where you're aware of every atom, the trillions upon trillions of atoms and, and how the electrons and neutrons and, and protons are circling each other almost in a cosmic dance. And you're aware of every one of them to the place that you know exactly how many times they're going to circle one another in that one second and you know every one of them by name. Then you can step back even further and every... The, the smallest molecule that man knows that the smallest element is called a quark. Much, much smaller than an atom. And you're aware of the, the multiplied uh, trillions of them within your body. But at the very core of it, string theory tells us and teaches us that there is a filament that is resonating with what I believe is the voice of God. It's one of the, one of the things about string theory. And so you see this entire multitude of a choir 
that makes up your very body. And it's trillions upon trillions of voices singing praises to the very God of creation. And you can hear them and know every one of them by name and know the distinct sound that they make. And you can appreciate the harmony at the quantum level. Now take that understanding and realize that God sees all the way down to the submolecular level everything in this universe and sees all that can name every single one every all, all the way down to the smallest quark and he can see all of time from the beginning to the end at the exact same time and is completely conscious of it that's what it means to be the i am and then you have this guy that has meditated for a while that started eating vegetables and, and he has so convinced himself that he can call himself the great I am. Now that is a delusion. Because you see, with, with what, one of the things we're going to find tonight, when, when you begin dealing with quantum physicists and, and, and temporal physicists and they begin brainstorming the possibilities of quantum mechanics, if you could move through time that you're not stuck moving linearly in one direction, but you could go back and forth and you come up with uh, concepts like temporal paradoxes that you end up being your own grandpa and all these different things, or meeting yourself and, 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 and causing a, a divergent timeline, all these different things. But one of them that I want to deal with tonight that they have hypothesized is that if, if we all know about cause and effect, that... If you release energy, it will cause an effect, and it always moves forward linearly through time. But if you could move both ways, you could actually have the effect show up before the cause. That the, the energy actually moved backwards in time rather than forwards in time if you were not limited to moving linearly through time. Now, I know I'm about to make your, your brain hurt here for just a second, but would you like to see God do that? Let's pick up in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 8. And what we find is that uh, Syria has entered into a confederacy uh, with Ephraim to take over Judah. In fact, Judah deciding to, uh, or Eph Ephraim or Israel, the northern tribes, deciding to attack and plunder Judah, we're going to find out is one of the reasons why they were completely dispersed. It's because they decided to move against Judah. And we pick up here in verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it not be a people. So in 65 years, God says, listen, I know what they're going to do, what they're planning. I'm not going to let them do it. But what, the, what they have set in motion is going to cause them becoming not a people. And that, that phrase is repeated in Amos and in several of those of you who were a people are not going to be a people. And then we see that translated over into the New Testament, the Apostle Paul speaking to the Gentiles of which Ephraim was disseminated said, you who were not a people shall be made a people. Same group coming in. Just wanted to kind of throw that out there. If God can scatter something, God can bring it back together. But then he goes on and he tells uh, uh, Ahaza uh, about this plan, but he promises him in verse 6 and 7. He says, now they're saying, let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach herein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of, of Tabal. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Now, you're the king of Judah, and you have a prophet come to you, Isaiah, and he says, listen, the northern tribes have, a, have made a confederacy with Syria. And they have set their heart on, on plundering and vexing the land. How many know that if you're the king of Judah, that's bad news? Especially when you put them two together, and it was really a force to be reckoned with. Syria was a mighty, mighty army. And so he knows that the king is, is going to be worried about it. And he, and he goes on and says, ask me how I'm going to do it. And, and the, the king tries to wax spiritual and said, oh, no, I, I'm just going to leave that up to you. Let me, and God said, no, 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 let me tell you what I'm going to do. 
and we pick up in verse 14. This is going to be the sign to the king that Judah and Syria are not going to prevail and come against them. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. So you want to see your sign? Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the good and to choose evil, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now, here's the kicker. The king's reign that the prophet's speaking to, he was reigning, uh, he reigned between 732 and 715 B.C. But the sign that God was going to give him would come 700 years later. So in temporal mechanics, the effect can, pre, can come before the cause. And so when God moves, God reached 700 years into the future and allowed Jesus to be conceived. And because he was conceived by the Virgin Mary, 700 years before, it stopped an army. See law. We can even go back, and if you read when um, Balaam was going to curse Israel, and you, you, have to, you have to kind of read it slow or you'll miss right over it. He said, there's one standing against me, stopping me from coming against them. He's there, but not yet. Huh. He's not yet, but he is now. <laughs> He, he, he's there, and he's stopping me, but he's yet to come. Because since Jesus is Almighty God come in the flesh, he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The moment time began, he filled all of it. You're going to get this in a minute, because if you're walking with God, let's say that God missed that moment in time that you needed his help. He could still wait 700 years, do something, and affect your now. You see, God can't, God can't miss it because for him, it is all now. And I, I read there was a lot of commentators said, well, yeah, yeah, well, Matthew, you know, he pulled this out of his hat. He was trying to point to the virgin birth. And some commentators try to say, well, you know, it might have been the son of Isaiah. It might have been this because it would, the word Alma, which is translated here virgin, simply means a young maiden, not necessarily a virgin virgin. And what they don't tell you is if you would go and find a handwritten scroll of Isaiah, because a lot of times in the typeset, they don't do all the uh, intricate things that the, the Jewish people do uh, with, a, with a normal handwritten Torah scroll or, or of the prophets. If you could go back and look at it, Alma is spelled uh, Aleph, Lamed, Mem, Aleph. But Isaiah didn't spell it that way. He spelled it Aleph, Lamed, Mem, Sophit, which that Mem is only, meant, is only ever used at the end of a word. If you have a Mem at the end of the word, it's a Mem, Sophit, and then Aleph. And the reason he used that is he did not want any confusion because Mem, Sophit means closed womb. That there is no question about it that it, he was speaking of a virgin birth. I mean, oh, God's word is extremely exact. But what really stuck out to me, and this really kind of, um, this is like the Holy Spirit wouldn't let it go. Have you ever been like that? You know, it's like the Holy Spirit shows you, and it could be just be one phrase or one, one word sometimes uh, out of a verse, and it, it, you're like a dog with a bone, and you just want to chew on it and chew on it because the Holy Spirit's just not letting you. There's, there's something there that is deeper and more real than just a surface scan of that verse. And that's when I start getting out Gesenius or Thayer's and, or Kittles, and I begin to really research. And what really stuck out to me is the next verse where it talked about how uh, that butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil. So that the one born of a virgin was eating butter and honey 
There was something from God that he was eating that gave him the ability to recognize evil and to reject it. And it's like you're reading that and you say, well, I like some of that. And so I began to do a lot of research, and, and uh, one of the commentaries that I read, I, th I think it was the commentary in the Old Testament, uh, he, he said, well, you know, butter is simply thickened milk, uh, maybe even considered strong milk, if you will. And I was thinking, hmm. I remember in Leviticus chapter 20, and I want to read this out of Leviticus 20, uh, 22 through 26. And this is instruction about God when they come into the land. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and to do them, that the land, whether I bring thee to dwell therein, spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manner of the nations which I cast out before you, for they have committed all these things, and therefore I abhor them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit this land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, between unclean fowl and clean, that ye not make your souls an abominable, abominable uh, by beast or by fowl or by manner of living thing that creepeth on the earth, which I have separated from you as unclean. You shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am the Lord am holy, and shall sever you from other people, that you should be mine. And there, there's several dynamics here that I just want I just want to take a look at. Number one, uh, it said that I'm going to take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey, and we've always thought about that as uh, a land of blessing and prosperity. But yet we find out that Messiah is going to be raised on butter and honey, and it's going to allow him uh, to, d to discern evil and to reject it. And so one of the things that I, I want to begin looking at this is, okay, now God is saying, okay, the land is getting ready to spew out the people for their abominations. I'm getting ready to bring you into the promise. What, what do we call the land of Israel? The what land? Promised land. I'm getting ready to bring you into your promise, and for you to stay in your promise, you got to stay clean, because if you don't stay clean according to my word, the promise is going to spew you out. How many of us have seen believers that begin to walk in the promises of God and begin to enter into a good thing, and then they start fudging on their walk with God, and the very promise that they believe God for spews them out? They lose the promise. They lose the blessing. Because the only way to stay in the blessing is to stay in the milk and the honey. To discern what is good and what is evil. And to know and not to do the evil but to do the good. We need to quit trying to be like everybody around us and let's start trying to be like Jesus. You know, Jesus was culturally relevant while never being like the culture around him. He stood out like a sore thumb yet everyone craved what he had because it was different. And yet we think we're going to take the gospel to them by becoming like them. And what you do is you embrace their gospel, not the other way around. You embrace their culture. You, and you embrace their things. We're to be separate because we walk with an almighty God that says, listen, with what, I'm, what I want to do in your life when you begin entering into your promise, you got to walk like me and not like the world because the very promise will throw you out. Just think about that for a minute because Pastor Rodhouse and I were talking today and what the, we, we need to understand that the most dangerous time in our lives is when we're in the promise and God is moving. We were dealing with the scripture when they were trying to cast the demon out of the uh, paralytic boy, and the other one of them took a turn, and Jesus, when Jesus showed up, uh, it was like you could see the disciples said, no, 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 you don't know what you're doing, let me do it. And then Jesus showed up, and he called his disciples a faithless and perverse generation. 
because that's what happens with pride. The moment you let pride in, you let that uncleanness in, then the very authority or promise or anything else begins rejecting you. You're trying to cast something out, and that very authority that you're trying to move in is trying to cast you out. So we got to be very careful. We, we're, we're, the more we are like Jesus, the more we can walk in the promise. The more we are like the world, the promises of God will run from you. And so I like to uh, <laughs> learn how to walk in a way that they, they run to me. Guys, there is a direct connection to keeping the commandments being separate and flowing with milk and honey. Milk and honey pay me more than just the speaking of a blessing and prosperity. Remember, the Messiah was to be fed with butter and honey that he may know, that he may know, that he may know to reject evil and do good. And right now, most of the body of Christ does not know to reject evil. They just see how much they can get away with and still try to make it to heaven. You know what? When I get to heaven, I want any hell in me gone. I want, in, I want to be so much like heaven that that's going to be the most natural place for me to be. It'll just be like stepping over a threshold because I'm so much like that that the world can't hold me any longer. I don't want to have to be frisked at the door. I don't want to have to have a strip search by St. Peter and say, you know what, you need to get rid of all that junk for we can let you in because all that smells like sulfur. We don't need that. So, if the, the Messiah ate butter and honey, I'd like to know really what that was. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4, verses 30 through 34. And this is the story of the woman at the well, and if you're familiar with the story, Jesus goes there, and they had, they had traveled all day. They're traveling through Samaria. And he kind of sets at the well and he sends his disciples on to uh, uh, purchase something to eat because they hadn't eaten that day. And while they were gone, he strikes up this conversation with the woman at the well. And then when they get back, uh, he just keeps on ministering, even though they're saying, like, Lord, I got your bag of McDonald's right here. You know, I, I, I got your food right here. Why don't you eat it? And we pick up here with verse 30. Then when they came out of the city and came unto him, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. So, you know, it's like, Lord, you know, it wasn't like you maybe just skipped a meal. It may have been, you know, it's been since yesterday afternoon since you eat, and now it's late into the next day. Master, eat. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that ye not know of. Well, what meat was it that he had to eat? Isaiah told us, butter and honey. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him ought to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. There's his butter and honey. To do the will of him who sent me. And there's two prominent questions that we need to ask here of ourselves if we're going to be like Jesus. Number one, when you walk into a situation, who sent you? There's been too many in ministry that they have sent themselves. If God doesn't send you, God doesn't have to back you up. He's not about your agenda. He's about his agenda. The second thing is Jesus said it wasn't enough to show up where he sent me. I'm not only am I going to show up, but I'm going to finish the work. Do you know over the years just how many believers, and this is both in all the different churches that I've pastored as well as with the seminary for the last 30 years, I've had people call and, and say, God's called me to this. God's called me to that. I feel like I'm supposed to do this. I feel like I'm supposed to do that. And then you talk to them in the case of the school. I had one the other day that originally contacted me in 1982. That was a while ago. That was when I was young and skinny. I was proud of my one gray hair back then. And so it's like, you know, dude, 
It's been almost 30 years since I've talked to you. What are you doing? Well, you know, God's calling us. Yeah, have you got it done yet? No, I ain't started. That's why I'm calling. I'm thinking, well, what have you been doing for 30 years? In the valley of decision. And actually, it's a, a, to me, it's a, a valley of disobedience. If you knew you were called to do it 30 years ago, well, I'm just waiting for the Lord to do something. He can't. He did something by calling you, then he expects you to do what you need to do to begin moving in the right direction. Now, see, Jesus, because he lived on the butter and honey of the kingdom, he said, he, he said here's the secret. I come to do the will of him who sent me. I have spent time with God. God has sent me to do something. And now that I've showed up, I'll not be content until I get it done. And that needs to be the way that we move in the kingdom. You see, if I know that I have purpose, there's a plan, and that it has to be fulfilled, it causes me to discern evil is anything of Satan's kingdom that hinders the call, that hinders me being where I need to be, or hinders me finishing the work. You see, if it's me calling me to something, then I can play with whatever I want to because it doesn't matter if it gets finished or not. But if it's God calling me, then my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to make sure it gets finished. And so I skewed everything else off my plate that interferes with the fulfillment. I've had a lot of students that enroll and never do anything because, you know, the new fall season's coming up and have all these great shows. You know, and even back then, there was something called a VCR. And now you have Roku and you have Hulu and, you, <laughs> you know, if it's really something you got to watch. And I'm finding out there's fewer and fewer and fewer of those that you can even watch as you start walking with God. But it's like, what time do you get off work? Four o'clock. What time you go to bed? 11 o'clock. What do you do? Uh, uh, what do you do? Uh, sit and watch the boob tube. I, I, I have found that in my own home because in my, in my culture where I was raised, my TV was basically my companion. You know, as a kid, I was, I was a latchkey kid, so TV was my companion. But what I have found out, you can watch an hour show, and the time goes like that. Or you can read half a book. <laughs> you can get a whole lot done around the house. Let me tell you something. And, and the time that I can watch a show, an hour goes like that. I can take me a pad and paper and pray and brainstorm, and I can come up with enough stuff that take me a year to get done. Can you see how some of these things are stealing the time? And so I've got to separate and say, okay, now there's certain things I've got to do, so I've got to razor out those things that would interfere with my doing his will or finishing it, and I've got to balance out which ones don't interfere with that because sometimes you do have to have some downtime. You know, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, turn off the TV, but, you know, you don't have to have 90 favorite shows every week. And to be truthful, you know, I'm speaking as a guy. Sometimes we, we, we watch stuff. We have 500 stations. And we complain that there's nothing to watch. Maybe you should turn it off and get in the Word. Play with your kids. Do something. That TV ain't going to show you no love. And you're, you're talking, and I, I, can, I can say like the Apostle Paul, and I was the greatest chief of all these things. I, I mean, I, I'm having a blast, guys. It's like with this. I, I just went downstairs. God says, open up the book of Isaiah. I open up, start reading. My jaw hits the, hits the top of the table. It's like, when did all this get in the book of Isaiah? There's temporal mechanics and, and temporal paradoxes in the book of Isaiah. That's when the computer comes on and the research comes on and, and uh, it almost takes me back to the, when, I, when I was in my, my early 
20s, uh, a bunch of us guys would get together, and we would have 20, 30 different references uh, scrawled out in five different versions of the Bible. We'd be, we'd be researching some, sometimes 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, wow. just having a blast. I'm thinking, boy, I guess I, you know, this, this is a whole lot better than a rerun of something I watched 20 years ago because I couldn't find anything else on TV. But look what Jesus did. Jesus received his purpose from the Father. One of the greatest searches for man right now is the search for purpose. You're never going to find it outside of God. The devil will give you a false purpose that will kill you. Whenever God gives you a purpose, it is food to you. It is meat to you. It is life to you. He received this direction from the Father. It's impossible to do the will of the Father without being, uh, without being directed to that will. I know that's deep. <laughs> but God wants you to do his will. He's going to direct you. If you spend time with him, he's going to show it to you. Uh, next, he, he received divine approval today uh, there are those seeking affirmation and approval from earthly fathers from friends from employers from culture around them some people are looking for approval from gang members they're so desperate for family they would rather have a bad family than no family but the truth be known is the only true approval you can really get is when the Heavenly Father says, this is my son and I approve him, or this is my daughter and I approve, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yes. When God said, one, one day I asked God, I said, God, is there anything else I need to do? And he says, I'm happy where you are right now. Just at that one moment, I was right where I was supposed to be. And it was like he said, I approve. And I, I tell you, you know, at, at times like that, you almost feel like a little kid and daddy's patting you on the head saying, I'm proud of you. You just need to be right where you are. I mean, that was worth me more than gold and uh, went a long way. Because he received his purpose from the Father, he received his direction from the Father, and he received his approval from the Father, he was able to move in the power from the Father. That's, and him doing that was the sign to a king 700 years earlier that the Syrians and, and the northern tribes weren't going to take his land. Because what God did 700 years later affected him in the now. That's why God can never be late. He's in your late, he's in your early, and he's in your now. We, we, we sweat bullets wondering if God is going to make it on time. He's got all the time in the world. Literally, he has all the time in the world. He could actually do something during the tribulation period to actually change something right now because what he does moves forwards and backwards in time from our perspective, not his, because with him all time is now. But if I'm going to be like Jesus, I, uh, Jesus was a life of action, of doing, that I'm here to do his will and to finish it. And as believers, if I'm going to be like Jesus, I've got to find out his will, I've got to be doing his will, and I've got to have an attitude, whatever I start, I finish. You need to write that one down. Whatever I start, I finish. You don't go two-thirds of the way and then quit. That's called a quitter. The Apostle Paul said, I have run the race. I have finished the fight. I have done all of it. James deals with this in James chapter 1, verses 23 to 25. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Because when you're a hearer only, you have deceived your own self. And there are Christians being self-deceived week after week after week after week in congregations around the world that hear the word and they never do a bit of it. They get excited about it. Oh, it sounds so wonderful. I can't believe that. Well, that's great for you, Dr. Lake, and, and all this, and I'm just so excited. But when they leave, they never do it. And if he ask them tomorrow what was taught to them, they don't know. They're like the guy that uh, his wife finally got him to go to church, and he went to church, and when they got home, she said, well, what did the preacher preach on? Uh, sin. Yeah, what did he say? He's against it. That's all he can remember. And actually, that morning, the preacher was preaching on the miracle of the fish and the loaves. 
He, he didn't pay attention. There's a spiritual principle here, guys. And the, remember me teaching uh, this last, the end of this last year that there is, there, there are, there is a law of entropy. It's, it's the second law of spiritual dy- of, uh, of thermodynamics. Well, it's also a spiritual law that there's forces in this universe that try to take the heat or the energy out of everything. And so in this world, there is a constant force waged against you to steal your fire. To, to steal your spiritual dynamics, to slow you down, to put you to sleep. You may have started out in a run, but it wants to get you to where you're laying down before you get finished because it wants to steal all your spiritual strength. And if you don't do the word, the, 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 the spirit of entropy will steal. It's like Jesus says, to he that hath shall be more to give him, but he that hath not, what he has shall be taken away from him. In other words, use it or lose it. That's exactly what the, the, uh, the apostle James is saying here. He said, now, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving your own selves. For if anyone be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Let me tell you something. In the word of God, before Jesus, the word shows you the sinner that you are. So that you can come to the cross, be forgiven, to receive that new creation, and then your, your vision of the word changes from that moment on. You don't see the repulsiveness of who you are. You begin to see the possibilities of who you are in Christ. But if you don't do any of it, you will forget what you see in the Word. That's why most people's spiritual victory lasts no longer than three and a half seconds. They look, wow, that sounds great. And then they walk away. What was that I was? We've all experienced that. The only way to stop that is anytime God starts showing you to do something, you got to make it habit. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm going to, and, and how long do you do it? Until you lay down in the grave. We've been dealing with some of the guys here that every day we got to stand in our authority. Every day we got to force our authority. Every day we got to choose to walk in the Holy Spirit. Every day we've got to resist that spirit of entropy. Every day we've got to we've got to push the, the dark forces away from our family and to welcome in God. Every day, a day you don't do that is a day that you just throw open your open the doors to your life and say, "Come on in, Mister Devil." You got to stop him at the door and say, "Not only get away from my door, get out of my yard." Just walk yourself on down past that picket fence and go on down the block somewhere else because you're not coming in here. And I'm going to stay on guard and I'm going to make sure tomorrow and the next day and the next day I enforce your eviction from my life. Because he didn't really grow tired. He just, yeah. Although he has to move through time linearly, he's a whole lot older than you are. You know, oh, I've been fighting off the devil for three weeks. For him, that's like two seconds. Boy, you think you have really been doing it. He just went and got a cup of coffee and come back. (laughs) What really irritates him and you begin busting that loop is if you get it done for three and four or five years and you got to the place that you do it without even thinking anymore because you've done it and you've done it and you've done it and you've done it. When I was in the military, there were certain maneuvers and, and dealing with our equipment. They would have us do it and do it and do it and do it and do it so that you could do it without thinking because you had done it so much, it became second nature. And see, what God's trying to get you to do is when you do the word and do the word and do the word and do the word and do the word, whether you feel like it or not, you're a doer of the word, a doer of the word. When the death devil shows up, you are, you are like a combat veteran that the enemy shows up and before you realize it, you already have him tackled and disarmed because you responded out of instinct because now your instinct is to do the word. In fact, A.T. Robinson in his word pictures in the New Testament translates this verse as, but keep on becoming doers of the word. Keep on becoming doers. Now, the, the doers that you were yesterday needs to be amplified as stronger than the, the, the doer that today needs to be stronger than the doer of yesterday. That you got, it's, it's a constant state of becoming. That has to be our spiritual attitude if we're going to be like Jesus. Guys, we never arrive. We can never let down life and his adventure, not only of hearing the word, but learning to do the word. 
I see too many Christians that are just trying to get their theological positions or their dogmas right. But let me tell you something, theological positions and dogmas never change the world. God is calling us beyond philosophical debate. He has called us to experiential realities. That means a reality that you can experience, that it's real things, tangible things. The word is to be lived, not debated. People that spend most of their time debating the word never live the word. I'm too busy living the word to debate the word. You're trying to argue with me that what I've been doing for the last three years don't work, and I'm the one with all the blessings. I'm the one that's separating the clean and the unclean, and God can go ahead and frisk me, and there's no unclean in my pocket because I have learned the word and I'm doing it. Guys, too much of the body of Christ is living in deception. Idle knowledge is a very dangerous thing. In fact, you've ever studied critical thinking, there's, it, it, it's, it's like unconfirmed knowledge. Or it's, it's, you think you know something and you don't. We've never seen that in church. I remember years ago when I was in this one charismatic church, but everybody was talking spiritual warfare. Big, like, yeah, we're bad. We're bad. We got victory in Jesus. And the devil showed up and they scattered like cockroaches. Somebody turned on a light. No. <laughs> Actual knowledge or real knowledge is you know and you can prove it and you can live it. That's right. Hallelujah. James goes on to tell us that we are judged according to our knowledge of the word. The more we know, the greater the judgment. Why? God requires us to live out what we know to be true. But it's in the living it that causes the blessing to flow. You see, there, there's some meat in your life that you've never tasted of. The good stuff. I'm, I'm not talking about going out and going to a five-star restaurant or, or, or the thrill of getting a new car or the thrill of a raise at work. I'm talking something that makes that look dim in comparison. There are some things that God wants to feed your spirit that, that is, has real sustenance to it that you're never going to get to if you don't learn to do the word consistently. Get methodical about it. Always be led by the Holy Spirit, but be methodical that you cover all your bases, that every time God shows you something new, you add it to the list of what you're doing now and learn to become an expert at its utilization in your life, not just passing knowledge. All, Christians like to debate passing knowledge. I, I, I don't want to listen to you. I want, I want an expert. I want somebody that can wake up out of, a, out of a dead slumber and take up their authority and cast out devils and raise the dead out of waking up out of a dead slumber you know, a dead sleep because it's instinctual to them and they have the battle scars and the trophies both to prove it. That's what I want. Guys, we need to learn to move when the Spirit of God says move. Romans 8, 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, if you have somebody in church they're not doing the word, and they're not being led by the Spirit. Now, we have a lot of people in church being led by a Spirit, but what they're being led to never matches the word. That's right. Then, That's right. number one, according to this, they're, they're not sons of God. Number two, they're not being led by the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. I've been in the charismatic movement all the way back since the early 70s. I've been preaching since I was 13, got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 16, then I, had that, then I ended up sowing some wild oats, you know, a lot of things that you end up doing, but a couple years later, glory to God, I came back to God the way I needed to. But uh, I've been around this thing a few times, and, and I, I've seen people do the craziest things, saying it was the Spirit of God, but it never lined up with the Word, so much so that somebody was divorcing so-and-so because God told them they need to be married to so-and-so. No, that don't work. I've actually had a Christian say, well, I'm waiting for this person to die so I can go ahead and marry his spouse. So you're coming into agreement with the Spirit trying to kill him right. or kill her yeah. so that you can have what don't belong to you because the Bible says you shall not cover your, your, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's belongings. Yep. Oh, then you can get into charismania where people walk up to you, God says you're supposed to give me your car. Now, when, when am I going to get the keys? My answer is when hell freezes over. Because you're not the Holy Spirit in my life. That's right. That's right. 
and you're not going to use witchcraft and manipulation to get me to give. Yes. How about you get up off your own blessed assurance and put in 40 hours a week and actually get a job and then get work so diligently at that job that they promote you at that job so that you could afford the car that you're wanting me to just to give you because you won't do the work that I do. Oh, none of this is in my notes, and it sure wasn't the way I preached it the other day, but this is okay. This one's on video. Let's go to John chapter 5, 19. Oh, if we could just be like Jesus. Then answer Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. The Son can do nothing of himself. The Son can do nothing of himself. You see... Jesus knew how to stay balanced. As a minister, the most dangerous time in your life is when God is moving, not when God is not moving. Because when God is moving, you can get the idea that you're the one doing it. And then you can shift from faith to pride in a heartbeat. Jesus stayed balanced. He said, I even though he was almighty God come in the flesh, he was trying to teach us how to walk in this flesh. And he said, I can do nothing of myself unless God tells me to do it. Unless God does it, it's not going to get done. Oh, pastors could miss a lot of snares. People want this. People want that. Well, people wanted a king too. And how good did that turn out? You know, if God doesn't do it, it doesn't need to get done. If God wants to do it, you better make sure it gets done. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doth, these also do the Son likewise. You need to mirror God. You almost need to shadow box God, except you're the shadow. He moves, you move. He stays, you stay. That ought to take a real load off our backs that... I'm not required to do something God doesn't want to get done. Right. Don't got to do it. Right. I'm not here to please you. Yep. I'm here to please God. Yep. Now, I've got to say in a lot of churches, the way that we do churches, we force ministers in being hirelings because they can't do what God wants because they're too busy pleaching pleasing all the people and wiping runny noses and patting people on the back and seeing if they got a little boo-boo because you preached too hard last, uh, you know, last weekend. That needs to stop because the ones that are doing that have been in the way for 30 years. Literally been in the way because God couldn't get what he wanted done in that congregation because everybody is so fleshly and so needy when oh, what they really need is approval from him and for him to send them and because in the sending is the healing. In the sending is the empowering. When I spend time with him, the, the infinite touches the finite and begins to change and to heal and to restore me so that I can go out. I can't do it for you. No, I don't care how big a preacher is or how powerful they are. They can't do it for you. That you can only get from Almighty God. You can't write a check big enough to get it. You got to write the check at T-I-M-E and spend time with God. Because he can't send you if you're not with him. It's like your brother Chuck was sitting right, standing right here next to me, and I decided I want a cappuccino down, down here at the filling station. I, because he's with me, I can send him to go do something and then to come back with it. But if he's not here, I can't send him. Now, that's deep. That's about as deep as getting into quantum mechanics and temporal mechanics like we did earlier tonight. But it, it's practical. If I'm with God and I'm, and I'm flowing with him and I'm letting him teach me and letting him show me and him moving me from unclean to clean and the moving from unsanctified to sanctified, moving from powerlessness to powerful, then he can send me. And, he's not, and the first thing he's going to do, he's not going to send you to Africa the first time out of the shoot. He'll be sending you down to the local, 
a local place to bring to bring your pastor a cappuccino or something or or to learn to clean the toilets and to, and to do these things you got to work your way up do you know i have seen men fight god's call in their lives for 30 years they said because i was scared that god god was going to call me to africa now, did you find out what he wanted no i'm, I'm not going to ask because if i asked i'd be responsible <laughs> Are you tired of running? Oh, brother, like I'm so tired of running. I just don't know what to do. Ask him. What do you want me to do? You want me to help clean the church? Lord, I could have been doing that for 30 years. You know. <laughs> We're so afraid of what God's going to ask us, and God never asks you what he doesn't equip you for. Now, on the extreme case of being a missionary, uh, there was a there's a guy named uh, oh, what Brother Hanson's first name but it has just slipped my mind but he ministers down in Haiti and he went down there and just fell in love with the people and felt like wow oh, God wants me to minister down there and he went and told his family his family said they hit you in the head when you were down there uh uh we're a United States folk. We, we, we like having Wally World down the corner. We, we, we like having the restaurants up here. Uh, if you notice, we have a teenage daughter, and she is a mall kid. She, she lives at the mall, and you're wanting her to go to Haiti. And so he prayed for a while, and he said, guys, just go there with me once. Just go. Just, let, let's go spend two, three, four days down there, and I'm going to preach, and you guys can go with me to spy out the land. And if you guys say that that's not what you want, I'll never go back again. The kids were crying on the plane because they had to go when they went. They were crying on the plane when they were coming home because they had to leave. Because they had been in the presence of God and God sent them. They can't see themselves anywhere else. Anywhere else. Kids found out there's life beyond the mall. There's life beyond school politics. Can you imagine what we used to think was life and death in high school? Really didn't mean five cents a year after you got to high school. Do you know how many guys I knew that were star quarterbacks in high school and they were the yuppie crowd, the ones, the shakers and the movers, that by the time they were 30, they were the biggest duds in the city. But some of the guys that were made fun of and geeks were worth millions by the time that they were 30. Come on, guys. We got to be able to see beyond the moment. And the only way that you can see beyond the moment is to walk with him who fills all the time. Right. You see, God knows the possibilities that lie within you because he sees the possibilities of tomorrow. But the only way he can get you there is you've got to be a man or a woman of action. I have come to do the will of him who sent me. Because he not only holds my tomorrow, he's already went ahead of me and prepared the way. And no matter where I am in time and space, he is ever present. That's why David said, where can I go to get away from you? Can I go to the highest mountain? You're there. Can I go into the bottom of the deepest ocean? You're there, Lord, because you fill all time and space. At the same time. Where you are 10 years from now. God is right there now and right here at the same time. And he's saying, if you let me walk you, I'll walk you into the miracle you need 10 years from now. And I'm going to take you one step at a time. That's why he told Abraham, come, I am almighty God. Come walk before me and be thou perfect. And the Hebrew literally says, I am the almighty God. I am El Shaddai. I am all that you'll ever need. And as you walk before me, I'm going to make you whole because I got a plan for you, boy. I know where you need to be 20 years from now. I know where you need to be when you're going to offer up Isaac on the altar. Now, I've got a lot of work to do to get you from there to here, but if you walk with me, I'm going to get you there. So when you enter into that pivotal time in your life, you do exactly what needs to be done to squash the devil and to open up my blessing to the world around you. That's being a man of action. 
That's living on the butter and the honey. To walk in a land that flows with milk and honey. It's not about blessing. God is saying, I'm going to bring you. Look at what they were doing. They came out of a place of slavery where they could never do what they wanted. They could not worship God. They could not do that which was right. They had to do what their taskmasters demanded them. He says, I'm getting ready to bring you into a land that you can really walk with me and live with me. And that land is flowing with milk and honey. It's hearing me and obedience to my will so that you can eat the good of the land. Oh, guys, the devil has caused us to sell ourselves short. The God who fills all time and space, the things, if he can get me to do the right things today, it builds my blessing for tomorrow. It builds my power for tomorrow. It, builds, it, it allows me to be in the right place at the right time with the right stuff in my heart. But if the devil can throw the unclean in there, the evil in there, I miss my blessing, I miss my, my appointment with power, and I'm way off course. That's why in the now is the most important. If I do what I'm supposed to do now, God has already got my future taken care of. Because every step he leads me in sets me up for tomorrow. That's why he can do something 2,000 years ago at the cross that it can affect you now. He can do something now here's one. We already, we already read where uh, King uh, Ahaza, the prophet, said, here's how God's going to take your enemies today. 700 years from now, there's going to be a virgin born, and that's your sign for today that God's going to do this next week. Okay. Now, that's, would you have to hate to wait for that sign? Guys, God is saying, if you do what I need you to do. I want to take it a step further. Okay, let's look at this. What God did 700 years later affected the now. If you're faithful to the call now, even though you're not to the place of completely being able to walk in who you are, if you're faithful in doing it, God will bless you like you're already there. Because your obedience 10 years from now can cause the blessing to come now too. You're going to get this. There's a reason why God hated Esau. Not only for what he did, but what his descendants did 2,000, 3,000 years later, God hated him for 3,000 years before the fact because the decisions he made affected that far down the line. But if I set my nose to God's grindstone to do what I'm supposed to do. God says in five to 10 years, you're going to really make it to where you need to be. But because you have set your heart and you have set your mind and you have set your will and you have set your determination on that, I'm going to start giving you some of the blessings now like you were already there because I know where you're headed and I'm already there with you in the now. How's that for temporal mechanics? God can do what temporal theorists can only brainstorm and say, boy, if we could just do that, God's already doing it. God's already doing it. That's the power of our God, and our God is calling us to walk with him in a new level of respect for his word, his will, and his ways. Because God said, listen, there's some stuff coming. There, I mean, there's some stuff coming on the earth. What I do today and what I do tomorrow and what I do the next day may be building the platform for me getting over and having my victory when darkness comes. It's not going to fall just out of nowhere. It's because God has been getting me, and if I'm going to have a hedge of protection, it's because each day I build a new brick and put it into my wall so that when the enemy shows up, he ends up having something that looks like the wall of China to overcome. When most Christians, they live their whole life and don't have a brick there and wonder why the enemy comes in so easily. A life of obedience to God is a life that is prepared when trouble comes. Because you're a person of action. Faith is a life of action. My action today enables my proper action tomorrow. And for heaven to have action in my behalf. 
Oh, man. If you can get this, it'll change your life. Because instead of the devil setting you up for stupid stuff that's going to happen five years from now so that you fall into a pit, and not only does he set you up, he gets you to dig the pit, climb out this so you can fall in it. And it's by your own making. Because he who does not do the word but is a hearer only is, has deceived himself. He has dug his own hole and then fell in it backwards on his head. Well, the devil was underneath a, underneath a tree sipping on, on tea watching you dig your own defeat. Or you can walk with the Holy Ghost and end up building a bridge over the hole that he had to himself dig for you. And when you get there, there's already a bridge to get you over. And it's made by planks of obedience. <laughs> oh. We get, in, in a sense, guys, we build our own pathway to a miracle. The obedience that we do today builds the miracle that we can have with God tomorrow. Or the disobedience that we live today. You can repent of it, but if you keep on doing it and doing it and doing it, there will be a hole that you will fall in tomorrow that the devil had you dig. Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. Father, we thank you that it will not return to you void, but it will accomplish where until you have sent it. Father, move in our spirits to be men and women of action that we live our faith not by our words, but by what we do. Day in and day out with breathtaking accuracy and consistency, Father. And Father, we just ask that you would make it so in the life of every person that listens to this message tonight. In Jesus' name.